My name is JT Parr, and I'm traveling the country to interview geniuses and find out how the world works. My recent conversations about neuroscience and AI made me feel super mixed up about what it means to know anything. That's why I interviewed CUNY professor of philosophy, Graham Priest, the author of Oxford's very short introduction to logic. Much like Plato and Aristotle, in fact, maybe even better than Plato and Aristotle, Graham and I challenge each other's perspective on reality. Here's our conversation. How can I destroy my loved ones with facts and logic? Why would you want to do that? To be like the man? What's masculine about that? How do you uh, self-define philosophically? Like, do you ascribe to a school of thought? Would you say you're like an empiricist, an existentialist? No. A stoicist? No. A legitimist? I don't, I think all great philosophers had insight and I think most of them got lots of things wrong, okay? So I don't pin my colors to any mast. Who is the most wrong? Jesus. Jesus? Uh, that, that wasn't uh, an answer to your question. That was just me with an expletive. Oh, okay. <laughs> Have, how do you feel about stoicism being wrapped up into so much modern capitalism? Is it? Yeah. Oh, it's incredible. It's like every real estate broker I know is like quoting Marcus Aurelius day to day. But I don't see why they'd be particularly interested in Marcus Aurelius. Because they're like, the market's up today, but I can't attach my own sense of being to that. I have to be, you know, calm in the storm so my clients know I can still provide them with fat houses that have nice decks and, oh, you know. Oh, I see. Top 10 fractions between zero and one. They're all the same. Do you prefer squares or circles? This seems to be a sort of repeated theme in your questions. Squares and circles, like all the others, they're, all, they're both cool. There seems to be a repeated logic in your answers. Hmm, yeah. Like, I could totally pick what's better, a square or a circle. A circle. Yeah, well, that's your view. Well, you think about all the sick shit that comes in circles. Basketballs, the sun. Then you think about the sick shit that comes in squares. Prisons. There are some very famous prisons built in circles where the guards can watch everybody because he's in the middle of the circle. The Panopticon. Foucault. Yeah, oh, so, uh, he writes about it, but it was invented by Bentham. Oh, dude, you bested me. What kind of music do you like? Different kinds. It's a very philosophical answer. How about mm. you just say the Beatles? Oh, the Beatles. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, the, the Beatles are a great band. I, I think Lennon and McCartney a songwriting combination, one of the greatest songwriting combinations of the 20th century. Totally. And it's partly because, you know, Lennon and McCartney had different personalities. McCartney was cute and sweet and so on, and Lennon was harsh and biting. I would describe our dynamic now as sort of Lennon and McCartney, but the question I would pose to you is, who's Lennon and who's McCartney? Because I think you would assume that you're Lennon and I'm McCartney. But I'm actually Lennon and McCartney. I think and I'm... And you're Ringo. I, I think I'm Ringo. We agreed. Excellent. Now, I know as a philosopher, you tend to not love agreement or high fives, <laughs> but there we click. <laughs> then we click, baby. That's what it's all about, dog. Graham, how do you feel like the interview's going so far? I'm not sure. I mean, just the amount of ideas that are coming through and then just the way we're clicking. I yeah. mean, we're totally same page. Like, I think a lot of people misunderstand to be your teacher's favorite isn't to be the one who's most like loyal or subservient to the teacher. It's the one who challenges the teacher in a way that they would have challenged their teacher. Yeah, that, that's right. That's the way it works, um, particularly in kind of Western style philosophy. It's a bit different in, in East Asia where um, because of the Confucian ethics, you're much more sort of loyal to your teacher's ideas. Why do you think Eastern philosophy has grown in influence over Western culture in the past century? Part of it is that we know a lot, we in the West know a lot more about it than we did a hundred years ago. Do you, so it's kind of like the dehumanizing components of our individualism and now we find some value in like the collective kind of spirit of Eastern philosophy? You can put it that way. How would you put it differently? Well, or would you say it the exact same way? I wouldn't say the, the exact same way. But close. Okay. What ways do you think like the Buddhist practices of mindfulness and meditation have been incorporated into Western capitalism? What people really mean when they talk about this often is that in Buddhism of most kinds, meditative experience puts you in touch with some kind of ultimate reality. And sometimes this is called nothingness just because it's ineffable, so you can't say anything about it. So there's this thing called the mindfulness industry now, which says, hey, I'm a mindfulness teacher, 
let me come into um, your business and teach people to be mindful for half an hour. Okay, it's half an hour, they won't be doing anything, but it'll improve their performance the rest of the time. Oh, and by the way, I'll charge you not much, you know, thousand bucks to do this. So I make a profit. If it works, you, the capitalist, make a profit. Um, so this drives the wheel of capitalism. Right. So there's this kind of like disgusting relationship that we've concocted between enlightenment and productivity. Well, it depends where the we is. I consider myself a titan of industry. All right. Now, I suppose the Buddha were to come back today. He presumably, once he got his head around this kind of screwy world in which we live, still want to be a teacher. So how would he go about it? Well, modern mass communication. So he'd have been asking himself, I guess, how do I use the mass media to try and help people? And not in such a way that the use of mass media is going to hurt them. I, that's, that's a really hard question, I think. Yeah, the manufacturing of desire. Desire is natural, okay? But it causes a lot of trouble. You desire things you can't have, so you get unhappy. And maybe even if you get the things that you desire, you find they're not fulfilling in the way that you hope they will be. Right. There's that hedonic treadmill where yeah, even exactly. once you do get the thing you want, yeah. you just quickly acclimate and then want exactly. something beyond exactly. it. Do you feel like we're friends now? Sure. Me too. Do you want a hug? All right. Thanks, Graham. All right, cheers, mate. It was a pleasure. Thank you.